I'm Claire Curtin, this is my colleague Wan Jing Lin, and we're uh, in that uh, map of what Marianne was talking about, of the divisions here at, at the lab. We're part of building technologies, urban systems, and then the subset of that, we're in the commercial building systems uh, group. So um, today, what we're going to talk about and the work that this group, um, there are uh, about, uh, I guess, six of us in our group that are the main core. We also work <coughs> with all sorts of other uh, folks in other uh, divisions and other parts of building technologies, but the real work on data analytics is done through our group. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to do a hands-on. Um, and uh, just as, as background, um, I'll give a little of my, how I got here, uh, same with Wang Jing. Uh, <clears throat> I've been in a couple of different careers. Uh, this one is uh, uh, certainly the most exciting and, and uh, uh, mind-expanding in a way. Um, I used to work at PG&E before here, Pacific Gas and Electric, our, our utility across the bay, in the commercial buildings group. And that was uh, a real interesting uh, uh, sort of introduction before I got here. Before that, I was at Internet and uh, doing uh, the uh, Auto DR program, which was actually Auto DR invented here at the lab, and uh, automated demand response uh, for those of you. And uh, before that, I, I did the simulation computer games. And <laughs> it's, it is kind of a weird jump, but I was uh, involved with the creation of uh, a game called The Sims. I was one of the designers on that, and another one, Sim City, and that sort of So. It's a, it's a strange mix, and uh, uh, my caveat is that uh, I'm not an engineer, I, I can't play one on TV, but I am just uh, the administrative sort of center as the program manager, and I will let Guan Jing talk about where she's from. Uh, so, hello everyone, I'm Guan Jing Lin. So I started my study in China, and then I pursued my PhD here in Texas A&M University. After I graduated, I joined the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and this is my fifth year here. Great, thanks. So, uh, like Jamie said, uh, interactive, we want to hear from you, um, ask questions, stop us, whatever. And in fact, I have a question because uh, we talk here a lot in, in acronyms, and I don't want to, we'll, we'll do a little bit of that, but we don't want to, you know, go too far into it. Um, in fact, thinking of when I worked at pg and &E, people could do an hour's meeting with all acronyms and no English. So it's, it is crazy if you're not used to it. So uh, everybody knows BAS, when we say BAS, we know what that means. Uh, how about EMIS? Does anybody have a, feel like we got a good understanding? Okay, some have some yes, some no, that's good. Uh, how about uh, EUI? <coughs> okay, we're, we're all pretty good. And, and we'll we'll also go over this too if you don't if you don't know. Um, uh, FDD. Raise your hand if you know what FDD is. Forest. Sorry. Forest. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it, <laughs> yeah. It can be uh, for, for us. It is fault detection and diagnostics, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And let's see, maybe A H A A H U. We know what H is. Okay. Good. All right. So we're we're all basically talking about the same language. Um, so, let me move forward here. So today's uh, bit where, where you're with watching and I, we're going to do uh, a few things. We are going to uh, center and get some grounding on the uh, DMIS work that we do here and what we mean when we talk about the DMIS. It has uh, a number of different um, uh, pieces to it that uh, we just want to make sure we all kind of have the same interpretation so we can all work together. We're going to do a hands-on activity where we will really hand out real paper. You can scribble on it, and we'll talk about what some of the uh, uh, problems are that you see that come uh, to the forefront when we get visualizations from these data analytic tools. And um, then we'll talk a bit about a, a big effort that we're doing here called the Smart Energy Analytics Campaign. And in particular, there will be a real uh, sell for, <laughs> for all of you to go back to your schools and hopefully uh, join up as a participant in the campaign. Uh, and then we'll end with uh, a new piece of, uh, of uh, 
software that our team has written that's a, an m and tool, and uh, Juan Jane will do a live demonstration of that. It's just released at the end of last year, I guess, um, last December, so hot off the presses, uh, and um, you'll see that uh, it's, it's also on our GitHub, so everybody can use it, and then get me home if you like. So, when we talk about AMIS, and what we're talking about here in particular, we're trying to, in, in everything that we publish and write and talk about, we're talking about this very broad family of tools. So, AMIS encompasses uh, fault detection and diagnostics, energy information systems, the dashboards you see, uh, and uh, 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 energy, or, sorry, utility, uh, monthly bill analysis. These sort of things are all under the umbrella of uh, AMIS, and, and it's how we discuss it. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, all, all of these technologies have the uh, capability of storing, uh, displaying, and in some cases, deeply analyzing um, the data that they're getting through these uh, built whole building systems. And they can be quite powerful in that their uh, ability to, to change the actual operation of a, a, a building or a, a equipment of a building. So then, we ask, why would anybody care about this and, and do it? Um, and in fact, are any of you currently using an, an EIS tool, a dashboard tool? Which Do you know which one you're using? Or what uh, product? Is it off the shelf? Did you write it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write it. It was off the shelf from quality uh, metrics. Okay. All right. And do you use it every day? Do you look at it? Do you... <laughs> Who, who, who's the... It's, it's actually a kiosk at the entrance to our building. Okay. So, and uh, when, they, when they bring students in for a new student orientation, one of their tasks is really just to always find a kiosk and, you know, look at the energy use of the building. So, uh, highlight, you know, energy awareness that way. Uh-huh, right. Right, and I just want to make sure everybody can hear if that was... Okay. And, Bob, did you have a... Yeah, we have an ALC product, and then we had them pull points across the network too from chill water return, uh, hot water, cold water, cooling tower water, so we can see everything and really criticize facilities operations. <laughs> <laughs> and they really want to hear you criticize. Nah, we're nice, so we're nice. Diplomacy, <laughs> I think, is one of the. the I like to say we're nice, so they can spend more during the day. Sorry, say again? They like to save money at night so they can spend more during the day. Yeah, right. <laughs> so so the, the, there are a number of reasons why. So the, it sounds like the kiosk at, at your, uh, your, your, your school is for information and for heightening awareness, I guess you would say, um, for, the, for the students who are in, in the building technologies area. So that's, that's one great way. In the, the use of those tools, too, though, it's uh, a there is an onslaught. There's a, there's a term that um, we hear fairly often. We don't actually like this term very much because it's a sort of negative. It's called um, uh, analysis paralysis because there is so much data coming in from so many different sources. It can be uh, in utility bills. It's from your trend logs. It's from this just crush of what can be a, a crush of, of data. So um, there's, a, there's a real need for someone who is overloaded that way to find a tool to help them organize that. Um, there, the other uh, uh, problem that, that facilities managers and, and energy managers are, are kind of faced with is that if you're uh, relying on utility bills, generally they are monthly. Uh, they come, and even if they're monthly, they come to the billing department before they get down the, uh, the, the path to the energy manager. So things can be uh, the the, uh, the uh, uh, answer to some of the uh, energy <coughs> excuse me questions or problems that could be seen are a couple of months back. So that's that's not optimal. Um, so we also know that one of the, the things and it's the kind of word that we're always trying to get out is that um, and we're looking at, at this continually in this group is that how much are these EMIS tools saving? Is it uh, is it worth the money? Is it going to be um, uh, useful in, in the various settings that, that you might have? Or is it analysis paralysis with 
so much data from some really great tools, but if you can't act on it, why uh, spend the money to do it? So um, what we're showing is that, or we're trying to show is that the, uh, the savings, the, the energy savings that you are uh, getting and acting upon from the data can be persistent over time. You know, just, uh, do the energy uh, measure and then uh, have it deteriorate over time. This, these tools can help you watch that. So again, we've got this, this guy who's, who's getting inundated with uh, way too much uh, data in the, in the photo. Is um, there are there's just a, a number of questions that how you use these these tools in the best way, and I mean, that's what we're trying to do. So um, a couple of ex a couple of examples. There are a number of, of products out in the market for um, for uh, EIS energy information systems, and also for uh, fault detection shown here in the upper left hand corner is um, is a, just a very simple uh, simple uh, utility bill analysis tool um, that is uh, can be a big improvement over a utility bill that has no organization whatsoever. This can, this can help you uh, see where your buildings are going. Uh, building automation system output in the lower left. Uh, the example of the fault detection and diagnostics, and we'll talk a little bit more um, um, fully on, on both fault detection and EIS energy information systems, the one on the lower right from Sky Foundry. So again, just to reiterate this, there is this uh, generally what, we're, what uh, we hear from uh, a lot of the organizations that we work with, and in fact this one is actually from Carleton College in Minnesota, who's uh, one of the participants in this uh, emerging analytics campaign, but they had data from every single source, and in fact some of it in the lower right hand corner, you can see is handwritten. So this is thrown at the energy manager every month to say, or, or uh, even less frequently, do something with this and find some energy savings out of it. So that's a, that's a <laughs> daunting task. You're, you're, you're nodding your head here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? He's at least he gets the it's, Okay. <laughs> Generally, it's, you would say it's sitting on somebody's desk and not getting to the <laughs> manager, but you can say it. a lucid building OS uh, product and really started to bring these things together. It's an ongoing process. This is relatively new for them, so um, the, just the visualizations of these are starting to help me figure out where they're going to spend their time. So, um, this is, uh, Guanjin's going to take a little bit of this part here. And um, this is the framework that was developed here to, again, really kind of understand that umbrella of EMIS. So in the following slides, I will uh, introduce a different type of EMIS technology, especially the energy information system and the fault detection and the diagnostic tools here. So <clears throat> Claire has just mentioned the EMIS, uh, there are different type of technology under this group. Umbrella, and if you see this diagram on the left hand side, I'm showing the EMIS types that are more intended to display and analyze whole building energy data. So, there are the benchmarking and utility bill analysis tool, uh, EIS or advanced EIS tool. And on the right hand side of the diagram, these EMIS types are more of the system level or equipment level data, uh, equipment level, level uh, tools. That means the main data input of these tools are from the building automation system. So uh, those are the temperature readings, uh, pressure readings, uh, flow rate readings from the building control system. One thing I'd like to, uh, so there are the building automation system, FDE, and the new technology we see just coming from the coming to the market. This is the automated system optimization that can do the two-way communication. So it's not just read from the BS, but it can write optimize the set point for the control system. Um, so one thing I'd like to 
uh, point out here, along on this diagram, we see very, very straight line dividing this type of te uh, technology. But in the reality, the boundary can be very fuzzy. So some specific EMS can cover more than one EMS type here. So in the following slides, I will focus on EIS and FDD. So energy information system, or we call EIS, so they are web-based tools to display and analyze the whole building and also submeter data. So the main data input would be the 15 internal meter data. So with EIS, the operator can uh, they can see much granular energy information. They can see not only how much energy they use, <coughs> but also when this energy is used. And also, advanced EIS, it will have the baseline model, which can predict how the energy use should be. So with this model, uh, it can generate alarms when you see the energy use is beyond the typical use. And it also can be used to track the project savings. When we conduct efficient project, we also want to know how much energy is saved and what is the payback. So energy information system can help on that. Uh, in 2013, we did a study just to assess the energy savings potential for this technology. And across a cohort of several dozens of that organization that's making use of EIS. We see a median portfolio annual savings of 8%. Of course, the capital projects and the ritual commission projects, in addition to uh, energy information system, were conducted in these organizations. But the facility manager told us this level of savings would not be achievable without the use of EIS. Hmm. The cost of EIS, so basically there are software costs. It can be divided into upfront cost. This upfront cost covers the system installation, the metadata integration, and also the front end design. And then there is also ongoing cost that usually charged per year that is used for the ongoing maintenance and system support. So we find the uh, the five-year, this is not on the slides, but the five-year software cost is about uh, $3,000 per year. And on the left-hand uh, side of the slide, I'm showing some examples of EIS products. So this is a screenshot from the EIS product. <coughs> so it shows the savings opportunity recommended in the with the, with the data, it will tell you this building has the problem of simultaneously heating and cooling. And also this building is operate longer than the preferred schedule. This is a portfolio view, so EIS can not only display a single building, but it can, can display the energy use of the whole portfolio. So if you see these circles, the red means most the building in these circles has high energy consumption, and the green is most of the building in the circles has low energy consumption, and the orange is something between. So this you can use this information to prioritize which building you should focus towards first. Uh, in the next three slides, I will show you how EIS was implemented. It is applied here in the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So three years ago, before we installed the energy information system, there were many meters scattered across the campus. So many of these meters, they are already integrated into building automation system, but different brand of building automation system. So each day will go to a separate day. So, and some of them has never integrated into system into any system. So just to pull the data from individual data server and put them together in a common Excel and then doing this manual analysis, 
with this in the hospital task. <laughs> so to solve this problem, we install an energy information system. We integrate all the meters in the field. But there is also a problem coming out because all of this, all these meters they are from different manufacturers. They are speaking different language. So we installed integrator first to get this uh, data into the integrator and convert the data to a more normalized format that can be easily recognized by energy information system and then fit the data in. <coughs> With the data, now we have an operating energy information <coughs> system with a more consistent front end. So the metadata is now very easy to access and analyze. And this provides us a great opportunity to make this metadata actionable. So you can see on this screenshot, you can see which building has the highest EUI. A reminder here is a clear also mentioned that before, energy information system, as well as the fault detection and diagnosis tools I will talk in a minute, they are just management tools. So they are not like high efficiency chillers. You install it, run it, you can get direct energy savings. No, uh, these EMIS tools, they are the tools can provide you the actionable for information. And the facility staff, they really need to take actions to make changes in their building operation based on the analysis results, and then you can see the real energy savings. The second uh, EMIS type I will talk about here is FDD. So FDD is a tool they read the data from building control system. They automatically run your analysis and then report back what faults are exist in your HVAC system and equipment. Or sometimes it will tell you what is the root cause of the fault. So since, since it makes this process fully automatic, so it saves you a lot of time for analyze. You do not need to uh, pick uh, the required data points and run the analysis for every very box, every uh, handling units. You can just take a look at the tool. And it also can prioritize the faults it uh, identified either based on the frequency or the energy penalty of each fault. Um, so literature shows the existing of faults in the building can impact up to 10% for building energy use. So the cost of FDD is higher than EIS because EIS usually just integrate the meter data points, so it is not that much. But at the end, you need to integrate all the data points from the automation system, so that should be hundreds of mm -hmm. thousands of points. So get these points, understand what those points are, and then <coughs> uh, create specific rules for these points, and uh, also need to keep <coughs> the stressors, so it will not so many force around. So this uh, cost, the high labor cost. Of uh, this is uh, just a large image of the example where I just showed before it is uh, a screenshot of the uh, FDD tour and it shows the force identified from different buildings and also the for the duration and uh, each fault which uh, HVAC equipment is associated with. So operation staff can take a look at this and then put the things they can fix. Perfect. So uh, we have directed a lot of resources to help people adopt, mm -hmm. understand, and expand the use of uh, this EMIS technology, which we think has great potential, but now it has limited use in the commercial building community. So here are two examples of the resource we developed. The first is the procure, uh, procurement supporting materials, which include uh, RFP, RFP template, 
a technology specification template and some guidance how you can select the products. So everyone can download this template and make the changes necessary and use for their procurement process. And the second resource on the right, uh, this resource highlights the top savings opportunity in commercial buildings and also describe how these saving opportunities can be identified with uh, energy information system and uh, fault detection and diagnostic uh, tools. And all the hand-on activity are coming today are coming from this resource. Uh, with that, I will uh, back to Claire. Thanks. And um, it, the, what you're seeing here in the resources are just two of many um, on um, a, a couple of places, but in particular in the Smart Energy Analytics Campaign website, we have a number of resources, these plus others. Um, this, this group um, and Miriam is also one of the contributors to uh, the Energy uh, Information Handbook, which is available for, um, for anybody. We have also recently um, uh, put together an, another template, like what Jane was mentioning with the RFP template, where it is, uh, you don't have to necessarily write your RFP from scratch. Uh, but there's a, a, a model that's very uh, EMIS oriented. Same thing with this. This is a modern based commissioning plan template. So uh, if any organization is um, ready to step into MBCX, then this is um, kind of a quicker way to just make your plan by filling in fields and, and again, not having to create the wheel. Um, so there's, there are a, a number of others, so I encourage you to go look there and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. So we're going to do some hands-on. In fact, uh, and let me pause here for a second uh, before we go into hands-on. Uh, are there any questions about anything that we've talked about so far? Yes. I've just got a kind of a question on implementation. Do you find our somebody <laughs> somebody took to heart the uh, the 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, uh, energy savings, and you can see quite dramatically that they were able to bring down um, the energy use. Throughout the throughout that month of May and June. <laughs> yeah, basically this is because the uh, change in seasonal operation. So before they are operating in winter mode, but in April they, when they switch to the uh, spring mode, they didn't correctly uh, re reset the night time control strategy. So they identify these problems with this map, heat map, make changes in May, and everything looks normal. So is it, it was a seasonal setback issue? Yeah. Okay. okay. Why are they using... Why, in, in winter, why are they using so much at night? So, uh, uh, actually, this is uh, the consumption of gas. Oh, oh, so this is not electricity, so this is gas. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's go to number three. So again, office building, uh, assume a pretty uh, standard office occupancy hours, 8 to 5 sort of uh, uh, operation. And here's our uh, uh, seven days a week of uh, load shape. So we'll just give you, again, probably about 30 seconds just to take a look at that. You can draw on it, you can uh, uh, do anything that you would guess as a facility manager that uh, making a fix would result in a different kind of load shape than what, you, what you're seeing here. Yeah, question? Does, does this office run seven days a week? This office does not run seven days a week. Excellent question. <laughs> yes. And for power, for power in your sake, I would just be electric and not natural gas. This is electric only. Yes. No, not natural. Yes. Okay. Another five seconds or so, and then we'll see what you said about this one. 
Okay, does anyone have any guesses or have any uh, fixes? You, you, you make fix, what is the, the load shape going to look like properly for this, this building? And we did have a really nice hint that came from over here. Anybody? What, what is this shape look like? So you're saying it's, it's wide? In, it's too early and too long, okay. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> Anybody else? This is an office building. They should not have picked demand on weekends. Let's see what the uh, answer says. Is that indeed it's true? This, this building uh, on uh, Saturday, Sunday um, after after the weekend setback control that was identified um, was able to to bring those two days down. And it does uh, to to your question. It does still have that. Uh, uh, 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, very long. So, oh, it was a little longer before, yes. Okay. okay, so that's number three. <laughs> All right, let's go to number four. <laughs> the supply fan is on. It's, it's on every day. And we're going to be seeing uh, data from uh, Wednesday through uh, a, a week, a little bit more than a week after that to Thursday. Um, I'm sorry, two weeks of, of data. So take a look at that. Um, think about what a, a shape of that supply fan uh, operation should look, be looking like if it is not um, correctly shown as long. This, yes, also in the context of uh -huh. Just this can be corrected, and when it's corrected, what would the what would the shape of this um, supply fan? Uh, I mean, what type of fan is it? Yeah. What type of fan? Do you know? This is a supply air fan in your air handling unit. So, say that you uh, the, the fan is running continuously is, is a, a comment we have here. So, supply fan, uh, given its nighttime setback, uh, curve would look something more like And correct, Saturday and Sunday, this is another uh, case where maybe a second level of um, <coughs> Uh, investigation needs to be done during those weekend hours to make sure that that supply fan is, um, if, if correctly um, uh, scheduled, that, that Saturday and Sunday might or might not be um, running. Is there any question on this one? There could be an indoor air quality requirement where they run the fan on weekends. Correct. Okay, number five. Here is, uh, and in fact, you have a, an extra sheet that's the background. The problem itself is uh, So I will. Uh, yeah, this is a, like, a little bit from knowledge I provide here. So I know most of you are familiar with air handling units. So they are very common. It's like equipment to provide a pool of hot air to the space. So this activity related to the economizer operation of air handling units. So economizer is uh, for if you see the diagram uh, here, 
This is a diagram of a typical air handling unit. So the outside, outside air coming from outside, it will mix with the return air from the space. And the mixed air will pass through the heating of cooling coil and then this heated of cooled air will be delivered to the space and this is the discharge air. So to save energy, air handling units usually has this economizer operation that it uses more outside air to reduce the need of mechanical cooling. So a common control, uh, control strategy for economizer operation is this outside air damper should open bigger than the user, but not too big. It only open big enough to allow the enough amount of outside air to cool the return air, to cool it to the discharge air set points, because that is the, the temperature the space one. So this is a common control strategy, and then we have our... Uh, this is a variable. Variable? Yeah. Variable. Yeah. So, so this is related to the economizer operation. We have the one day temperature measurements from the air handling units. We have the outside, outdoor air temperature, return air temperature, mixed air temperature, and also discharge air temperature set points on the props. <coughs> so if you can look at the day trends uh, to see any of them, it is not <coughs> at the uh, right position. <laughs> so I will... Uh, this uh, economizer will use the control strategy I, I put it here. So the outside air sample should only provide enough outside air to let the mixed air temperature close to the discharge air temperature set points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is there is a, there is setbacks that are scheduled for the discharge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. Yes, yeah, 100 to the Which of those uh, groups would be changed um, after we discover that this problem is mixed air? Mixed air. And how, how, would, how, would the, uh, how would the mixed air change? Yeah, you are correct. So the problem has happened in the uh, back of. Yeah, the, the problem is in the mixed air temperature because it is followed very well with the outside air temperature. That means the outside air damper now is fully open. But uh, what we required, the discharge air temperature set points, it is higher than the mixed air temperature. That means we do not need that much of outside air. But it seems the damper is not moving as we expect. So. There is this outside air damper is stuck fully open. And the, uh, the fault detection and diagnostic tool will automate, uh, automate all these logic of uh, this type of analysis and then tell you the results directly. So you do not need to make this process and look at uh, the data trends yourself. It will tell you directly. Yeah, the answer is the outside air damper damper is stuck open and it also provides you some recommended, uh, recommended actions what you should check for the equipment to see where the equipment leads to this 
It's got a manual crowbar actuator in it. <laughs> <laughs> I always have three cooling available. The control system's looking to, for discharge air. It's going to select outside air damper to be open in this situation because the return air would cost more mechanical cool. However, the problem is that all night long it's doing this thing. So that indicates the fan running all night mm -hmm. to the outside air. I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't see the damper is necessarily being stuck open. It might be the manner of by the control system. <coughs> right, somebody may have overridden. No, it's just, it, it's That's free cooling is available. Well, it looks it's like it's going to be fine. So if you provide the, the, the temperature at low and then the command will maybe reheat in the zone. Well, if you're reheating, that's another yeah. that's another yeah. that's another yeah. that's another yeah. problem. Because if you're <laughs> charged in there for set points of safety, and your your heat valve is leaking by discharge is just higher than acceptable. That's not an outside air problem. <laughs> uh, so in these air handling units, the uh, control strategy will be like this the outside air and the return air can mix the two uh, set points. I mean, that is what we want. But when the system operates, it doesn't run away, it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. We can discuss after, the, after this, and we can move to next. Okay, number six in the package. <laughs> this. This is um, our space temperature readout. Uh, it is um, showing a particularly uh, unique kind of data output here. So this one uh, is, is a fairly quick read, uh, at least, it, that is scaled correctly. And anybody have any uh, guesses what we're looking at here? There is no human comfort, and why not? Exactly. 140 degrees is um, probably outside the, the temperature range of most human beings. Um, again, not, not a grow house, not a hot house growing flowers. Um, so where would we, we would guess, and again, this is, this is uh, office, uh, office building temperature would be something closer to what would you say? Yeah. Seventy. Yeah. Um, so, so this one, uh, the facility manager. Realized that the uh, uh, there was a, a sensor error here, and uh, the temperature and uh, the humidity sensors were, were out of whack. So again, just if this is a, a simple one, real quick read. If you see that 140 degrees uh, for an office being dead giveaway. Uh, yes, exactly. It is a very dead um, occupancy. Alright, and going to our very last hands-on. Um, here is the output for um, a portfolio of buildings. Uh, this one from a uh, Schneider tool. And in this visualization, it, it uh, is able to give uh, a large number of buildings all at once. Um, you can see that the red ones are uh, 
uh, displaying that they have a very high uh, EUI, the green are the lower ones. Again, this is a, uh, it doesn't take uh, too much to look at, at what uh, we would learn from this of which buildings would be the buildings that would get the attention for, for their energy measures. Um, does anybody just want to throw out what you think? Who would, who would we look at first as the biggest problem? Number one, building one, and after that, who, who might it be? Five, and then... And 11, there's, there's another building in here that um, uh, is, is actually quite uh, instructional. Um, does anyone have any guesses? Got, so so we, we know that the, the ones that need the most immediate attention are, it's, is that one, five, and uh, 11, it looks like. Some of those might be energy hogs, and you might know that the high EUI is, is uh, acceptable. Um, there's the, the building, there's one building in here that everybody else can kind of learn from. If there is a good building, the dark green building, which is the right corner, yes. So uh, building seven, right. So this is just, again, a good visualization facility manager can say, I can prioritize those red ones, and I can see if, if they do have a, a uh, similarity, and, and as you say, if it's not a lab, if they're all pretty much the same, that um, number seven is doing something right. And um, if it is not, uh, you know, apparent, go go do some investigation on number seven and apply what is working well there to bring up some of the others. So, um, so that is a question. Is there research? Yes, we, do, we did the study in 2013 and then we see this kind of technology can let the facility staff know how the things go on in the facility and then take actions on that. Question? With this space being so dynamic, for instance, some of your original, with, with the, your original EMIS providers are now kind of really deep in AFDP. We saw mm -hmm. reservation one yesterday. How are you tracking kind of that, that marketplace shift? In the well, we have some uh, ongoing AFDD research uh, that is a, a little bit outside of, of our group. So, uh, we have different kind of uh, research here. We have uh, uh, research here to ed educate the building owners to let them learn more about this technology so they, so they can get better confidence uh, of this technology and know how to make best use of this technology. And uh, we also have the IMD more of research and development activity here to try to develop better options <laughs> to uh, identify faults and even can fix these faults aut automatically and in the control system. <coughs> so the model predictive control is an ongoing activity here and you, you will listen to that this afternoon. Question. So, so this was generated by the Schneider Electric? Correct, that's the output from the Schneider uh, product. And that was listed earlier on the startup list? Um, the, the actual uh, tool or uh, product itself. Um, uh, yes, and well, the, the name of it, yes, and in addition to that, um, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about Smart Energy Analytics campaign right now. And um, just uh, uh, sidebar is that in this campaign on the website we have a number of resources and one of them is a find a product resource and all of the uh, EIS, FDD, um, uh, uh, automated system optimization tools that are on the market that we have um, been able to take a look at are listed there with links to all of the uh, products and Schneider is absolutely there. So, um, so that we can keep going on our time. Yes, question. Just out of curiosity, uh, with clock detection diagnosis, 
participants in this. So um, uh, we here in the, in the Energy Management Information Systems Group have been running the Smart Energy Analytics Campaign since May of 2016, and it's, a, it's an initiative that the Department of Energy um, has uh, uh, launched and that we're running managing. Uh, the idea of it is to really get commercial organizations, and we have participants from a really broad range of um, of building and organizational types um, and get them into the campaign to get some uh, very one-on-one -on -one and very specific kind of technical assistance that we can give to, to any of the indi individual participants in this campaign. Um, and what we ask them to do is tell us, are you already using EMIS? If you're not, and if you're like right on the cusp of adopting a new FTD, for example, um, you know, come and join the campaign and we can, we can try to help you with some resources so that you are best informed on how to go forward. You can talk to other uh, FDD users um, and in fact we are, are getting a, a nice group of um, FDD peer cohort that talk together um, with, with a little bit of our uh, um, kind of management on the subject matters but we, we are able to just move down the field a little bit what everybody is doing. So if you're currently um, involved or if your organization is, is involved with this, what else can we, what else can you get out of it? Um, can you push it a little bit further so we can help you do that? And again, those who are not yet um, fully mature in their use and implementations, we can also help on the front end of that as you're writing an RFP, for example. So. Um, so we ask that every participant uh, who is uh, joins in the campaign, um, you know, sort of the quid pro quo here is we, we want to give you as many resources as we can to help you figure out and do the most efficient uh, uh, use of your EMIS. But what we ask for in, on, on our side is that we get some data. And this is what DOE wants us to, to do so we can really characterize this market of EMIS and, and where it is. Um, so uh, there's a, a reporting function that we have made, um, we've tried to make as, as uh, light a touch as possible and as uh, easy as possible, but what we do with that is, is really um, get what kind of energy savings are coming out of the EMIS use of the participants in the campaign. So you saw many slides back um, when Guangxing was describing uh, under EIS and FDD the kinds of uh, percentages of savings that we're getting. <coughs> the data that, that uh, so we're always, you know, uh, updating and looking to make sure uh, that we're getting the, the best kind of data and that those numbers are correct and, or that we change them to really reflect the market. you have a question? Yes, pardon me. Yes. Uh, but I almost asked you the last time you used the term MDC. 
What does MBCX mean? Great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, monitoring based commissioning. And this is a, a bit of a, a new term, I guess, in the, in the market where um, uh, commissioning agents uh, will be using uh, or look to use the tools of EMIS to be doing an ongoing commissioning of the building. Um, what I guess the kind of old style of uh, commission building walk away and then have it uh, slide <coughs> off of its, um, its energy profile. Um, that this idea of monitoring based commissioning is, is something that um, uh, we, we are working with uh, the Building Commissioning Association uh, to, to make sure that this idea is linked up with the tools that are available under uh, EMIS. So here we are uh, for any participant in the campaign, and like I say, we have a number of, uh, of a very broad range of buildings in it. We have a lot of colleges who are really doing the, uh, it, it seems to be doing the, the most work um, in, in this area, uh, but also office buildings, hospitals, uh, county buildings, city buildings, K-12 schools, um, you know, really pretty much any uh, commercial building that, that you can think of. We have uh, 55 participants right now. So this is a just a bit of a list of, of who's in it, but we are always accepting new participants, and so we would love to have anybody talk to me if you think that uh, your college or your uh, organization would be interested in, in joining up with us. Um, and like I say, we get a very uh, uh, close relationship with all of our participants. We know uh, who who they are and what they need. Uh, we talk to them constantly in this uh, under the guise of, of technical assistance. One of the other things we do, and um, it has been a real draw for a certain number of participants, is we offer a recognition, um, also known as awards. Yes, any question? Yes, you can absolutely participate without the recognition. This uh, this is kind of a throw your hat into the ring idea. If you want to, um, uh, uh, we, we ask for a little bit uh, extra data for those who apply for this recognition. And um, two times a year, we have uh, recognition sort of ceremonies where uh, in the spring, we, we give energy savings awards. Um, in the fall, we give new installation awards. So in the last uh, calendar year, 2017, we just completed our first year of awards. Uh, Ten organizations in total got it. So here's an example of um, uh, UC Davis um, has, has done some, some very interesting and innovative work. So, um, so the, the categories are on our website. Um, uh, are on the uh, Smart Energy Analytics website. So what we did was we invite them to a, uh, to a, a, a recognition ceremony. You can see Jessica Granderson there. She's, she's with us in picture, not in, uh, in, in, the, in the flesh today. But uh, uh, the, the thing that also comes out of it is some good national recognition for those organizations who win them. Yes? I have a question about that. Uh, my first encounter with that Sets, they can also use this limited data sets to 
do their best with this information to try to play. You can, you can also, they have the default uh, rules or you can program the customized rules to provide your allowance if you think something is not uh, in your schedule. And for the old system, the library units, if they do not embed the FDD logic inside the equipment, they can also install a new advanced controller that includes this capability. So I think I'll, I'll just close up the, the piece about the campaign in that, um, like I say, we're, we're always looking for new participants. And um, there are a couple of parameters of, of what we need for, for those uh, participants who are accepted into the campaign. But um, come and see me, we, we have uh, a lot of flexibility on who it is that we accept into the campaign and who, uh, who we would like to help in, in this uh, moving their EMS down the field a little bit. So I think with that, we're going to do another quick change over to a, another uh, bit of uh, effort that our team is doing that's on measurement and verification. And Guanching is going to uh, demonstrate the tool that was written by our group. Uh, we have to change the headers. You know, why don't we just go ahead and do it? And so I will make it very brief. <clears throat> uh, so one key capability I mentioned before is the EMIS can be used for measurement and verification. This is a process that to calculate the energy savings achieved by the energy efficiency projects or uh, energy conservation measures. So traditionally, the energy saving mm -hmm. estimation it is either conducted by uh, utility bill analysis or most of the time engineering calculation or simulation model. So those approach either uh, need a, a long time period of data or it is a very labor cost. <coughs> it's like high labor cost. So with EMIS, with the input of interval meter data, we now have this new approach, we call it MMV 2.0. So basically, we have the internal meter data before the efficiency project is uh, implemented. So we collect it, uh, we call it baseline or pre-installation. We collect the meter data in this pre-installation time period and use this, mo this data to create a baseline model. Usually, it is a regression model uh, with key drivers like the outside air temperature, or building occupancy, or the time of week. So with this baseline model, we can use it to predict how the energy use should be if these measures are not implemented. <coughs> and the difference between this predict energy consumption and the actual energy consumption we see from the post-installation time period would be the energy savings we are looking for. So this approach can be fully automated in the EMIS, so it will uh, not really reduce the cost. <coughs> uh, so we have developed, just released an uh, open, open source R package to conduct the MMV 2.0. So you can use this uh, tool to visualize your pre and post meter data create a baseline model and then calculate the savings. And I will give you a brief tour on that. And to my laptop. Yeah, we have to switch um, laptops because this one does have, um, have some, some software installed. So this is the link of the open source package. And as Quentin uh, said, that this is released just about a month or so ago. So um, uh, the developers of it um, on our team are, are interested in hearing feedback. There's uh, a good deal of uh, uh, use that we, we want to hear how how it's being um, how it's being used and problems you're running into um, and.
So this is the landing page of the tool. So to, to, to conduct the, uh, the energy savings analysis for our project, first we need to create a new project. So, uh, we, we select the savings analysis. We create a new project and we give it a name. And then we select the directory where I want to store the results. <coughs> we select the location where the pre and the post meter data is located. This is the location where the pre-installation data is and also the post-installation data. pre-installation and 12 months post-installation data and then we can prop now this is a new change baseline model. Uh, this is a uh, uh, commonly used public available regression model and then create the model with the pre-installation data. And we do need to check about the model uh, results to see how the thickness of the uh, model, to see if the model it is good enough to predict the energy consumption. After we check, okay, the model looks good and then we go to the savings estimation and uh, the savings results is shown there. We see 40% savings from this project with the data we prepared. So if you want to know more details and the more capabilities about the tool, you are welcome to go to the website and download the tool. And they are also use uh, the guidance on the website. So 
Oh, we have a question over here. Two, two questions. Uh, is this running on OpenEIS, or is it a... Uh, so this is a Groundhog app, which is running on OpenEIS, and it's running on Okay, so it's it, okay. And then second, is there continuing technical support available if we would use this? Uh, yes, so this was just released about in member last December, so uh, we are continuing working on the second phase of the tourism. Thank you. Keep, keep this up for a minute. Yeah, people are writing. Sure, yeah. And like I said, the storage will be available to everybody. So that brings us to the end of watching and Claire's new MIS quick tour of what's going on at LBNL. Uh, we'll be around for a little bit afterwards. I think lunch is going to be brought into this room. So um, if you have any questions on any of these pieces that we talked about today, uh, please come and wrangle us. Um, one of the things um, that we wanted to do in front of those activities, the hands-on activities, they were taken from this uh, resource that was written in the last year uh, called Top Opportunities for Commercial Building Efficiency. So we've got one for everybody. You can use it as you like, give it to your students. It was um, uh, created under the Better Buildings um, Initiative that we are working with with DOE. So it's um, free to use and distribute as you like. And it is uh, downloadable on the smartenergyanalytics.org um, website.